Um, hi, everybody. So my name is Susan Schwartz, and I want to welcome you to this Parent University Workshop. Um, I am the Program Director for Pasadena Education Network, Penn. And uh, we presented uh, this workshop for the first time last fall. And so we're looking forward to doing it again. And uh, hopefully we'll have time to take any questions since we're a small group tonight. Um, uh, but I do want to say that if you have not already signed up on our website for this program, uh, to please, uh, uh, Suzanne has just dropped the, uh, the sign-in uh, Google sheet in the chat. So if you can make sure that your uh, email address is there. And the reason is we're going to add, be offering a lot of resources and links. And rather than try to put them on the screen or have you copy them out of the chat, we're going to send a follow-up email uh, to share all that additional information. So, um, yeah. And so I, uh, I would normally be doing this with um, my colleague, Laura, but she is not, she's a little under the weather, so I'm gonna be doing it solo. So bear with me if the um, uh, <laughs> technical end of things is a little sloppy, we'll do our best. Um, and let's go ahead and get started. Um, and actually, you know, before we get started, I'm going to, I've introduced myself. Um, I, uh, we have Suzanne Berberian, who's here from the Family Resource Center. Uh, we have our interpreter, whom you just met, Ada. We have uh, Jeff Albert, who is uh, hosting us from Collaborate Pasadena. Thank you so very much, Jeff, for that. And uh, why don't you take a moment and, and if you can, unmute and introduce yourselves. Marianne, do you want to start? Hi, I'm Marianne. Um, my daughter is starting to kindergarten at Jackson in the fall. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> All right. Super. <laughs> and Aslan? And if, if you're not able to, uh, oh, there you go. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Oh, the, Aslan's my son. Sorry, I didn't realize I had his. Uh, name on here. But um, yeah, we're, um, Aslan's going to be a kindergartner this fall and he's going to be attending Hamilton. Oh, okay, great. So we have, that's great that you are taking the opportunity, both of you to, to get familiar with what what's out there and what how you can be involved. Um, it's been a, a period where it's been really hard for parents to connect in the ways that we usually do. So um, so we're all excited that hopefully by next year, it will be a little bit easier for parents to connect. And so we appreciate your effort. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, and okay, so let's see. I'm a little rusty. I haven't done that many presentations since the fall. So I'm still kind of remembering how to do this. Introductions, we just did that. Um, so one of the things I wanted to start with is that there are a couple of reasons that people uh, typically, uh, parents typically show up at our children's schools and uh, wanna participate in some way. Um, and the first one is sort of, we wanna know what is, how do things work, who decides, what can I do to, to support, to feel connected with, our, with my school community? And the other one is kind of what could be. Uh, so perhaps something has happened and you have a concern or you have an idea for making things better. So parents want to know how can I or we effect change. Um, and so that's kind of our framing a little bit for tonight's presentation. Um, and our goal is that, you know, whatever it is that brings you here this evening, our goal is for you to come away with a better understanding of how parents like you, whoa, that went too fast. Let me go back. Um, how you can make a difference at your children's schools. And so we're going to spend the first half of the workshop kind of looking at how our engagement impacts not just our own student, but the larger school community. Um, and we'll, we'll look briefly at what the various school based parent organizations are and what they do. And then we're going to spend the second half of the of the workshop talking about uh, how to participate constructively. So, what are some strategies? Um, we'll talk a little bit about what to do with all our questions um, and a little bit of understanding about how how that works when you're in a meeting. And then we're going to talk a little bit about how to engage others with the greatest 
chance of having a positive outcome. So I'm going to go ahead and start with kind of the, the first thing is sort of how does our engagement impact our student and the school community. Um, so most of us, uh, I think, do not think of ourselves as leaders with a capital L um, up there at the podium with everybody looking on. Uh, but we can be leaders in our day-to-day -day lives. And, um, and so I think it's really important to kind of think about the things that we do in our day-to-day -day lives where we do play a leadership role. And that might be uh, meeting with your child's teacher. It might be uh, ha having your child help with uh, chores or other, other activities around the house and sort of showing them how to do things. It might be a volunteer role in the community. Um, and I, I think that, you know, when we think about parent engagement, uh, we like to think of the pyramid, right? So uh, the most basic uh, way that we uh, are involved is, is the, the most foundational. It's, it's really just the things that center on our own child, supporting our children, getting them to school, making sure that they're ready to, to learn, tuning into communications from the, the teacher and the, and the school and the district. So that is kind of the foundation of this parent engagement pyramid and leadership follows from that. Um, and I, I say that because it's, you know, you may get involved uh, at the next level at, at helping out with your something happening with your child's classroom, or you may be in, involved with activities at your school or even at the district level. And we'll talk a little bit more about, about that uh, the school and district level engagement opportunities. But the, the thing to sort of keep in mind is that you can kind of be a leader at any point on this map. Um, it's not just about having a formal position or you know, officer title. Um, and so how we conduct ourselves when supporting our own child and interacting with others, teachers and staff and other families uh, really does matter. Um, when your child is, when you're getting your child to school on time, fed, rested, ready to learn, that affects the teacher in the classroom and their ability to teach all the children. It affects the other children in the classroom. So even though it's something you're doing just for your own child, it has a bigger impact. And so I think that's a good place to just sort of start, especially for you as you're just starting out with your child going to school. Um, so I'm gonna kind of uh, stop and ask uh, and feel free to just unmute and, and answer because um, do you see yourself, uh, this is just sort of, you can hold up a finger, or one or two fingers, or you can just sort of say, but, but we'd like to sort of see where people are starting from. Um, some people would say, oh, I'm not a leader. Some people would say, oh, I'm a leader in some aspects of my personal or work life, but not in the school setting. Um, and, you know, and then on up to having served in official leadership positions. Now, since you uh, are both just um, with a child starting into school, then I, I'm assuming um, that you haven't yet served in an official leadership position at a school site, but that's, um, that's fine. Uh, so just kind of thinking about where you are at this point. And does anybody wanna chime in and just, uh, you can just unmute yourself and, and say kind of how you see yourself relative to, to leadership in your life? Um, I personally have not yet had a chance to serve in any leadership role um, for my child, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it'll be interesting because I, I am looking to get more engaged um, when he starts kindergarten. Yeah. Okay. And Marianne, did you, did you want to add anything for yourself? Um, I... I haven't been super involved in leadership roles concerning school and my daughter too much, mostly because the time she's been in school has been through through COVID, so we can't really get that involved. But I do, I have done a lot of kind of community service and ser served uh, as on the board of a couple of community organizations and stuff. So that that part I am used to to being involved that way. Okay. Well, that's that's great, and I think you know we all we all learn from each other in these in in this setting. Um, so people are going to be coming in to your kid's school who have more experience, you know, if not at the school, at least in outside leadership positions. 
and other people with less. And um, I think part of the beauty of being involved at the school is that everybody kind of is on a level playing field. People bring different experience and skills that they might have, um, but there's a real opportunity for everybody to kind of learn how things work and help each other and others understand what's going on and how to advocate for their uh, for their child's needs. And that's, that's sort of a part of what leadership is, whether you're in an official position or not. Okay, um, so I'm going to go through and run through the parent organizations here, um, and we'll just talk a little bit about each one. Um, and I, um, you know, with the, just the two of you, I don't want to, um, I don't want to spend a lot of time reading the slide, uh, but basically most people have heard about PTA. Um, that's the uh, Parent Teacher Student Association. Um, sometimes it's a Parent Teacher Student Parent Teacher Association PTA or Parent Teacher Student Association with an S, usually at the secondary level. Um, and that's a national volunteer-based organization. So it has it is independent of the school. It has its own bylaws and charter, and uh, the units at each school are their own 501c3 nonprofit organizations. Uh, and it has a whole set of governance rules that that you know uh, pertain to that. So a lot of people think of PTA as kind of a fundraising organization, but in fact, uh, its its mission is really to make every child's potential a reality by engaging. Um, uh, families and um, empowering people and communities to advocate for all the children. So it's actually more of an advocacy organization than a, um, a fundraising organization. Um, then there are a few uh, uh, organizations at the school level that are sort of there by mandate. Um, so English Learners Advisory Committee is required at schools with 20 or more students who are classified as English learners. Um, and they're there to advise the principal and school staff on programs and services that support those English learners. And also to it, those meetings are a chance for them to learn about what they need to know as parents of English learners about the, the that support program for, for students learning English. Um, the School Site Council is a, a group that is made up of parents, teachers, or staff, and the principal working together to uh, monitor the, the single plan for student achievement, which is includes budget decisions and uh, really is looking at how the school is spending its funds and, and resources in order to achieve academic success for all the students. Um, so that's a little bit more, um, people who are a little bit more data oriented tend to gravitate towards that. Um, but it's, and it is an elected uh, position. So you, you get elected by, by your school community to represent either parents or teachers or staff. Um, but again, all these, you know, these, uh, these groups are, um, are open meetings. So anyone can attend a meeting of the school site council or the ELAC or the PTA or the, um, the other school advisory groups. And you may not be able to vote um, on, on decision-making, but you, you can learn quite a lot from just attending some of those meetings. And of course, those meetings have been done virtually uh, this past couple of years, um, which has been Interesting because some people have more access to that than others. Um, it's been really difficult for the English Learner Advisory Committees because those parents have tended to have less access to the technology to be able to join the meetings virtually. Um, and, you know, but it, in some ways it's also allowed people to attend meetings more easily because they don't have to actually go someplace to do so. So there's kind of been some pros and cons in terms of the, uh, uh, the way things have functioned, but typically they are in-person meetings. And uh, um, and then the African-American Parent Council, I want to mention that is, again, uh, sort of what it sounds like. It's parents, teachers, admin, and community members who are supporting African-American students and their families. Focus on closing the academic achievement gap um, for that group. But uh, but in this, this is a district-specific organization. It doesn't have a charter outside of PUSD. Um, unlike the others, it's not mandated by state law. Um, 
but again, um, a lot of the things that that group has been working towards are things that are of, of common interest to other parents and other, other families as well. So I think although there are groups that are focused on a particular part of the population, we can all um, learn a lot and benefit by, by just sort of showing up at some of those meetings and learning about the issues that different groups are, are presenting and, and concerned with. And then there are a whole lot of other school committees and advisory groups. Annual fund is a, a fundraising, as the sound the name implies. It's a fundraising organization. Um, it's uh, handled through the Pasadena Educational Foundation, PEF, um, and is able to raise money for big projects, for even for staff positions in some cases. Uh, so that is a fundraising organization. And then particularly at secondary, you tend to get a lot of booster groups who are supporting a particular sport or performing arts area or something, other, other kinds of enrichment areas like that. Let's see. And then um, at the district level, those are all school, those are all groups that have, uh, have a group based at the school site. At the district level, um, the PTA council is sort of brings together all the PTAs um, and helps to support those PTA uh, units at the school sites with training, with um, you know a variety of, of other kinds of supports, just answering questions, helping them to advocate um, and uh, manage their what they need to do at the at the school level. Uh, there's also a district uh, ELAC or English Learner Advisory Committee. There's a district advisory council, which plays that same function for the school site council. So again, meeting at the district level, but there to support the school site councils, to represent them, to help bring information from the district out to the school site council members. Um, AAPC also has a district level organization that meets monthly. Um, and then there are some other councils that are only at the district level. So the Community Advisory Council is uh, uh, charged with looking at uh, special education. And that right now is a district level committee only. Uh, there's a foster youth council at the district level. Um, and, uh, and again, they typically have a meeting that happens monthly. And we on Penn, we usually post these on our calendar. Uh, the Family Resource Center also has a calendar that, that sort of shows um, the, the, uh, when the, the district meetings are happening. Um, and, and, and again, I mean, obviously, if you have a particular interest in a subject, um, it's worth going to those meetings. Uh, but sometimes you can learn a lot from attending one or two of those meetings just to sort of see what kinds of things they're talking about and what kinds of information um, they're, they're getting. And let's see where we are here. So quick quiz. Um, I'm going to see if I can if I can make this go away here. Um, sorry, my, my thing is blocking the view here. Uh, so matching the acronym to the mission. Um, anybody want to take a stab at that? Marianne, you want to try PTA, match it to its mission here on the screen? Uh, the third one. Okay, engaging and empowering families and communities. Yep, that's right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, how about the English learner, the ELAC? Does anybody remember what that, that one is? And feel free to just unmute and jump in here. The last one. Yes, English learners. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't, because I can't see all the thumbnails very well, I'm sort of, it's hard for me to tell if, um, who else is on here. So um, if you're on and you're a participant and you want to jump in and unmute because we're a small group, you can just shout out the answer. Um, how about SSC? Does anybody remember what that stands for and which one, which of these it uh, goes with? Okay, so that is um, that is the school site council, and it is the one, this fourth one, determine the focus of the school's academic instructional program, budget, and related resources. 
And then um, AAPC, uh, their motto is Black Students Are Our Business, African American Parent Council. And the CAC, last but not least, is the committee, no, Community Advisory Committee, um, which really doesn't tell you very much, but that is the, the group that makes, uh, that looks at special education students and um, meets monthly at the district level. I'm gonna keep going here. So um, the last time we did this, we, we had kind of some, some guests who came and introduced themselves. Uh, we, don't, we didn't gather everybody together, but we did uh, sort of, we have a few slides. Um, so I'll just sort of run through them kind of briefly. Um, uh, this is Scott Harden, who is the, the president of the PTA Council of PUSD. So he is in charge of the Parent Teacher uh, Association at the district level. Um, and, you know, his point that he wanted to make was sort of what I mentioned earlier, which is that while many people see PTA as fundraisers for the local school sites, the real mission is to serve as advocates for great student outcomes at all of our public schools. Um, and not so much necessarily about raising money, but, but giving of time uh, and energy to provide programs and volunteer on campuses. Um, in ways that enrich the, the, the school population and support the teachers and so forth. Um, and Scott has been the, the past president this year, is the president this year of the PTA Council and will be again next year. He was just reelected for the next year. Um, let's see, so I'm gonna keep going. Uh, this is Begonia. She is the president of the, the DLAC, the District English Learner Advisory Committee. Uh, council rather. Um, and uh, again, I mean, I think that she uh, felt like somebody who was really busy, but she, um, you know, she decided to step up because she really cared about making sure that the English learners in our district were getting the education that they need to reclassify, which means and become proficient in English. So they go from being an English learner to reclassifying as English language proficient. Um, and she is an amazing person. I'm going to keep going. This is Jennifer Higginbotham. She has been the chair of the District Advisory Council. Um, and again, I think somebody, you know, as I said, uh, who really was interested in the data and how the budget for the school is being uh, used. And so being on the school site council was a chance to have a voice in how the school functioned and, and really helped her understand what were some of the challenges that were facing the school community in terms of the different groups, the different academic areas that they were working on. Um, and, and I can attest, uh, having gone to district advisory council meetings um, over the years, that even if you're not on a school site council yourself, you can really learn a lot about how things work and where the money comes from to pay for different things and how, that, how those plans get made just by attending these meetings. Um, and uh, so again, I, I think even if you're not ready and, and you shouldn't really try to jump in right away into a, a, a high leadership position, but you can learn quite a lot from just going to the meetings and getting to know the folks who are, who are there. Uh, this is Natasha Mahone and Nia Harris and, um, oh, I'm blanking on her name, but it will come to me in a moment. Uh, Nicole Phoenix, right? Did I have that right? Okay. Uh, they are the on the African American Parent Council. This is an amazing group. Uh, this um, is really uh, a group that is pulling a lot of people together from the community, um, uh, taking a very positive and constructive approach to uh, making change in the in the district. Uh, as an example, uh, one of the things, an initiative that the African American Parent Council started a few years ago, right, the year before the pandemic, was a uh, sort of an in-class tutoring program for first and second graders uh, who were struggling with math. Um, and they, what I thought was really amazing about the way they did this was that they worked with the teachers union and with the district curriculum and instruction professional development uh, administrators to design a program where they would bring in and train volunteers and, and work with the teachers to have them in their classrooms, working with students who needed a little extra help and support. 
And, um, and it wasn't just working with black students either. So they were really supporting um, any student who needed help in those grades with the goal of making sure that nobody got left behind. Um, so very, very amazing um, group. Um, and again, one that even if you are not directly, um, if you're not African American or your student is not, it's still uh, kind of cool to go to those some of those meetings and and just sort of hear about the issues that they're raising and and the way that they're uh, thinking about and advocating for students. Uh, this is Warren Skidmore. He is uh, the chair of the Community Advisory Council. Again, that's one of these district level uh, programs. Um, and, um, and some schools, uh, you know, are actually, you know, experimenting a little bit with working at the school site level, but there is no school uh, counterpart to this to the special education community advisory committee at this point. Um, can we go on here? Uh, and then this is, uh, let's see, let me get my little doohickey out of the way here. The LCAP PAC, this is a, LCAP stands for Local Control Accountability Plan. Um, this is the state's uh, uh, funding that comes, this is the funding that comes from the state to support academic achievement and particularly for um, different groups of students. And each district has to have a plan to say how they're gonna use that money. And that is the LCAP or Local Control Accountability Plan. And there is a parent advisory council that meets at the district level. And, um, and they kind of have a, a little bit like what the site councils do, but they sort of are, are looking at this big picture at the district level to see how the district is, is um, putting together its big plan to make sure that all students are well served. Um, and so they actually go out and work with the different parent groups to get their recommendations and try to advocate for making those a part of the district's plan. Um, and my colleague, Laura, is uh, co-chair of this group right now, but uh, so she can tell you all about it another time. So, okay. So your homework, and Suzanne, do you wanna drop the homework um, link in the chat? Um, we have a... a a little uh, homework piece, which is just sort of a, a, a worksheet for you to help you sort of think about, okay, I'm gonna find the parent groups at my school, at my child's school. Um, I'm gonna find out when they meet and how to attend one of the meetings. Um, and so it's just, that's, that's your homework for next year. <laughs> or you can even start this year before uh, the year is over if you wanna start attending some of these meetings and finding out what it's about. Um, and I'm gonna just pause here and ask if there are any questions. And I'm gonna stop sharing. Find my cursor, there we go. And yeah, I just like to see if there, I, I just talked for a long time and covered a lot of things. So I'm gonna pause and, and take some questions. And feel free to just jump in. You don't have to put in the chat, but we can be informal here. Okay, I'm trying to I'm trying to give it the adequate pause for people who need like a moment to gather their question. Um, we can we can take more questions later. So I'm gonna just I guess I will charge ahead here. So let's see. Um, okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna, we're kind of in the moving into the second part of our workshop here. So uh, what we're gonna do next is we're going to go back to that sort of um, two reasons why people show up, the people who just want to know what's going on and want to connect, and the people who want to make a change. And I will go back to sharing. And how do I do this? Slide where I was. And way down here. Okay. Oops. So uh, what is, uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about the art of asking useful questions and what could be, we're gonna talk a little bit about how to get from reaction to action. So I will keep going. Um, so this is the point at which uh, uh, Laura would tell you that she uh, has a hobby and one of her hobbies is asking questions at meetings. 
Um, so you may also be that person who just has a million questions and can't wait to get answers um, and always has your hand up. Um, and you may be that person who's in a meeting wondering why that other person has always got their hand up asking all these questions and can we just get on with it. Uh, but either way, what we're hoping to do with um, our this next part of the workshop is talk about, you know, how can we ask questions in a way that is really um, constructive um, and more intentional and strategic. And so um, I'm going to start with the when to ask questions. Um, some meetings have a very structured, uh, a lot of the, the parent group meetings have somewhat structured um, formats and uh, and you have a, a public comment period. This is true also at the school board meetings. There is a time for public comment. There's a procedure. You need to submit a card saying you have a public comment to make. Uh, you have a, a set amount of time in which to make your comment. And um, and you need so you need to be aware of, of what those rules are. Um, there, uh, when it's a virtual meeting, you may be able, in some cases, to drop a comment, to drop a question into the chat or something like that. Uh, but for certain meetings, there is a there's a particular time when you can do that, um, and so that's something to just be aware of, depending on the meeting that you're in. Um, in some cases, and again, um, thinking of a school board meeting as an example, uh, there is an uh, you may only be able to ask a question uh, that corresponds with the um, uh, when that item, a particular item that's on the agenda. So you can't just ask any about anything. You have to be asking about a, a particular item that we've come to on the agenda. Uh, some meetings will create what they call a parking lot where they may take questions that are not right there on the agenda and just sort of put them over to one side so they're not forgotten. Um, and uh, a lot of times are on online meetings, that may be something that gets followed up later. Um, and then obviously there are other meetings that may be a little bit more informal and you can just raise your hand and be called on. Um, but I, I will say that in virtual meetings, when even though you could drop any question at all into the chat at any time, um, it's a really great idea to try to keep it on topic uh, because I, and you may have noticed this in, in meetings sometimes where um, the chat can kind of go off on a tangent somewhere and, and it's not any longer, uh, you know, somebody is commenting on something that is, that maybe somebody said something in the meeting and, and now the, the presenter is on something completely different and the people in the chat are having a conversation that is unrelated. Uh, so it's, it's good to be thoughtful about that as well. Um, and then, so that's sort of a little bit about the when. Um, and Laura, Laura makes a point of, you know, she, when she came, uh, she did not grow up in this country. And when she came here and came to her first PTA meeting, she didn't understand that there was this protocol and she didn't understand why she couldn't just ask a question at any time or raise her hand and be called on at any time. So, you know, you may have experienced this sort of thing in your life somewhere else already. Uh, but not everybody has. And so that is, you know, that is part of the reason that we kind of make a point of, of mentioning it. Um, and the and the rules and the protocols will differ a little bit from one type of meeting to another. So, you know, when you get to, to a meeting, you want to just kind of observe or ask and find out what the protocol is. Um, why to ask questions? Um, this is something we don't always think about. Some of us are very thoughtful and don't just blurt out the first thing that comes into our mind. Some of us are more um, spontaneous. <laughs> um, but it's, it's, you know, it's also really good when you have a question to sort of think about what you're asking that question for. Um, and so these are some, some uh, instances where there may be a reason to ask the question. It might be that uh, you as a member of the audience are not understanding something. Maybe somebody used an acronym that you don't know or some jargon that you're not familiar with. And you may not be the only one who doesn't know that, that term. So sometimes when you ask that question, everybody learns something or a lot of people do. Uh, sometimes the speaker may just get a little bit off track or maybe you're part of, of the, uh, the board or the team that's putting on the meeting and the person who's speaking forgets a point that you had agreed you know, was gonna be an important thing to bring up. So you might, raise your hand and remind the speaker, you know, oh, Susan, weren't you gonna say something about um, 
And so that's another reason to ask a question. Um, defining sort of helping the, the to kind of keep things on task and help the process or the cause. So sometimes we get into a discussion and maybe uh, get a little bit off task or a little bit away from what it is we're here to decide or talk about. Um, and so sometimes someone will ask a question that just kind of brings us back to our, our meeting goals or clarifies what it is that we're doing. Um, uh, and then sometimes you're just needing to ask a question because you need to know something, obviously. Um, and so some examples of that uh, would be, and I'm gonna just make this small here. Let's do this. Um, so an example of a question to help the audience is, can you please define this acronym or this term? Um, if a speaker is, you know, uh, gets a little bit sidetracked uh, or mentions something and then doesn't come back to it, you might want to raise your hand to ask, you know, did, you know, you, you had said something about this. Can you, you know, please be sure to go back to that before we move too far ahead in the conversation, just as sort of a reminder. Um, you know, reminding the group to step back and sort of remember what the purpose of the meeting is or what it is that we're really trying to accomplish. Um, uh, you know, so, so or there's some confusion about uh, some data that's being presented. Uh, so, you know, I think, I think that, that it's helpful, again, just sort of think about the purpose of the question um, because different questions do serve different purposes. And so you want to tie your question to a particular purpose. Um, how to ask questions. Um, so here, uh, you know, just like if you were, you know, if you were going to the doctor's office, you might make some notes to just be able to remember, oh, I wanted to be sure to ask about this. Uh, so if you're going to a meeting and you know there's some things you want to find out, you know, make some notes for yourself about what it is that you're going to ask. Um, uh, and, and why, again, sort of back to that why to ask questions. Why are you asking the question? Are you asking just to sort of let people hear you talk or how knowledgeable you are about something? Or is there, you know, is there a real purpose to, to asking that question? Um, obviously, you know, you want to keep your tone respectful and curious and genuine, you know, authentically um, in keeping with the, the spirit of the meeting. Um, and and I think, you know, you want to sort of keep it in, in um, what's the word I want, just sort of in keeping with the context. So, you know, sometimes people really want to go in depth about something and you have to kind of pull back and say, yes, we could have a conversation about this and maybe we'll write it down in the parking lot that we need, you know, time to really talk about this in detail. But right now we need to sort of make a decision about this or we need to sort of get through this piece of, of work here. And so we're not going to go to, into all that depth right here. Um, and this last one, um, I, I think that, you know, if you're coming to a meeting where say somebody from the district is making a presentation or, or your principal is making a presentation at, at a school site meeting, um, if you have a very sensitive question, you may want to take it offline and, and ask that separately. Or if it's just a, a, a question that is going to require some preparation on the part of the presenter to be able to really give you the answer you want. Um, it's really helpful if you can email that question ahead of time and say, you know, when we have our meeting, I'm going to want to ask about this, you know, so just want to give you a heads up if, if there's some, if you can prepare for that, that would be great. Um, and sometimes you may not be able to send something out ahead of time, or they may, they may not really have a chance to do that. But so, you know, it's, it's rather than trying to put somebody on the spot, you know, what you want to do is say, okay, I, I understand that you may not be able to answer that fully right now, but, um, you know, I'd appreciate it if you could follow up with me or get back to us with something about that in the next meeting. Um, how not to, okay, so obviously, you know, you don't want to be confrontational. Uh, you don't want to give so much context about a question that you're really just driving everybody else in the meeting crazy. Um, you know, sometimes people say they have a question, but they're really just kind of venting or telling a story, which is not the same. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, these are, these are kind of self-evident, so I won't, I won't go into any more detail with that. But um, let me break here for the moment and, and ask you if you have any questions. <laughs> 
And again, feel free to just go ahead and unmute and ask. Um, we can be very informal here. No questions from my end. <laughs> Thank you. <Okay. laughs> all right. Um, all right. Does anybody need like uh, a moment to just sort of stretch? <laughs> Uh, or take a bio break. I don't want to, I want to, we're, we're getting kind of through this fairly quickly, but um, if we need a short break, I can do that. Um, but otherwise, I will go ahead. Uh, so the last part of this uh, presentation is really about what if, what if you've got a, a, an issue and you're, something happens, you know, most of the time, everybody's very happy with their child school, but sometimes something happens and we're not happy and uh, it's very easy to get into reaction mode. So one of the things that we really emphasize is the importance of getting from that initial reaction to something more constructive, which is action. Um, and I, you know, sometimes a thing happens, people's inclination is to vent about it with somebody in their family or a friend or to rant on Facebook or some other social media platform, which we really advise against. Um, it does usually more harm than good. Um, another reaction might be to go and just make an accusation or blame somebody for not doing their job. Um, and another one is just to sort of withdraw and feel like I, it's hopeless, I can't do anything about this and, and just sort of get depressed. So those are some examples of reactions that we might have in the moment. Um, and the thing about reaction is that, I mean, it is emotional. Um, and it it's often based on untested assumptions. So when we first hear something that we have a re response to uh, that's emotional, we don't, you know, we may not have all the facts. We may not really know what the whole story is. Um, the other thing about reactions is that they tend to generate reactions from other people. Um, and that can be, uh, and that can be a whole other set of problems that, that result. And it, it's, it's often not very productive. It can even be a little bit destructive sometimes when you get that chain reaction reaction. And, and the basic thing about reaction is it generally does not lead to a positive solution. So what we try to advocate for is uh, in, instead is action. And action is thoughtful. Um, it requires being open-minded. So rather than just sort of going on your untested assumptions, you have to kind of try to stay open and look for more information um, and other interpretations. Action also involves engaging others. So whereas a reaction tends to just generate other people to react, action is about engaging in a, in a constructive way. Um, it's creative. And so it, it tends to lead more likely to solutions. And so those are sort of how we define those two states, reaction and action. And so what, what I'm gonna talk about next is just a little bit of um, uh, how we get from act, reaction to action. And we have three basic strategies and one guiding principle. So it's super simple. Uh, the first strategy is to ask questions. The second one is to reflect. And the third one is to engage. And the guiding principle through all of this is to keep an open mind. So let's uh, look at a quick example. Um, let's say your uh, child comes home from school with a scratched knee and torn jeans and says, a kid pushed me down and took the ball away. Um, that's uh, naturally, you're, you're likely to have some questions, right? Uh, so you want to keep an open mind. Um, you want to ask when it's, we say asking questions with an open mind, one of the phrases that we, we sometimes use is ask with curiosity. So ask with the idea that you actually want to know the answer, not that you think you know the answer and you just want to get the other person to say it. So, so in this case, how did it happen? And perhaps, you know, in some cases, the answer may be something that uh, you can wrap up fairly quickly. You know, my friend and I both ran for the ball and he bumped into me and I fell down and he got the ball. Well, you know, maybe you should be more careful. And that could be it, you know, it could be as simple as that. But sometimes it's the answer may lead to more questions. So let's suppose the uh, how did it happen? The answer is, oh, this big kid came and pushed me and took the ball for him and his friends to play with. 
Well, now you probably have more questions to ask, right? So, uh, you know, now it's time to sort of really get a little more information from your child. Um, and uh, and then at, at that point, you know, you have some reflecting to do. So now we kind of get to that reflection stage before we go to the let's do something. Um, so what have you learned so far? Um, and, and what's important for you? Uh, you know, in this case, obviously you want your child to be safe at school. Um, and then another kind of basic question besides what's important for me is, is this part of a larger problem or is it just a one-off, just a one-time incident? So there you might be thinking, well, who is this big kid? Is that kind of behavior typical? And how does the school handle this kind of situation? So now um, you're ready to start engaging other people. Um, but who do you want to approach first? Um, typically, uh, what you, as a, as a general rule, what you want to do is, is start with somebody who's close to the incident who might know more about what happened. So who is it that would have been supervising during recess? Um, a teacher, maybe a new aid. Where can I find this person? And then, you know, how do I start the conversation? Um, and that's sort of where you start, and then you kind of work your way up from there if you need to. Um, but let's say you found the new nade, and how do you start that conversation? So at this stage, remember, you're still looking for information. So we're going to start with uh, strategy number one about asking questions. Um, and so, you know, did you see what happened? So notice that um, you're just stating what your son told you. And you're asking a question. And so there's no accusation being made, there's no blame, there's no confrontation. This is this is still a very open sort of, I heard this from my son, maybe you know more about it, could you tell me? Well, let's say the, the new name says, oh, well, it was the third graders turn to use the balls and sometimes the younger kids get out earlier and grab all the equipment and the big kids get mad. Well, you're probably thinking, are you gonna let a third grader knock my son down just because it wasn't his grades turn to use the ball? Well, that is not okay, you know? I can't believe there are not enough balls for each grade. And you know, now you're, 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 you're possibly having a reaction again. So remember, keep an open mind. And here's why. If you have a reaction, you're going to just probably generate another reaction. So now the new Nate is thinking, you know, you're angry. The new Nate is thinking, well, she thinks it's my fault. You know, I'm just one person. How am I supposed to do this? You know, she's, here's a troublemaker. Uh, so not a, not a helpful um, strategy. As an alternative, you know, you can make a statement like, I know that you want the children to be safe during recess. What do you think we could do to try to make sure things like this don't happen? So um, when you engage others, you wanna try to assume positive intent um, rather than jumping to, you know, oh, you let this bad thing happen. You know, I'm sure that you want the kids to be safe just as I do. And, um, and then asking that question, you know, what, is, what do you think would help? How could we how could we work together? How can I support you? Um, and so the thing to notice is that there is this whole each of these strategies obviously supports the others, and um, and keeping an open mind is important all throughout the process. So uh, I mean, for example, um, there's just sort of an, as an example, there are the questions: What do you think would help the children play more safely together? There's a chance to reflect on what you heard when you got more information from the new aid. Not enough balls, hard for one adult to supervise. Now you might want to engage some other people. You might want to go to the principal or to the PTA and say, you know, this is what I heard about what happened. You know, let's start thinking about some possible solutions. And when you start thinking about possible solutions, you want to keep an open mind. And, and that is, you know, the problem might look like one thing to you and it might look like something else to someone else. And the solution might be different. Um, you know, there, there's not just one way to solve a problem. There may be different solutions um, and other people's ideas are going to be helpful. So again, as you engage other people, you're trying to think about what your common goals are, what you all want for your kids to be safe, to enjoy playing at recess, and then you can be more open-minded about what the solutions look like. And... So just to review the three basic strategies, ask questions, reflect, engage others, and keep an open mind. And so 
again, for the asking questions, you want to ask with curiosity. Don't assume you already know the answer. Um, the reflection, you know, I think the, you know, sort of the key questions are that what is it, what, what's important to me? What are the things that I really care about here? Is it part of a larger problem, a, a pattern or a system, or is it just some one-off thing that happened? And who should I speak with first? And again, you know, start really, start low. Do, do not call the superintendent. Do not call the principal every time something happens. Start with whoever was right there and, and work your way up if you need to. And then engaging others, again, start close, work up and out. Think about how you're going to open the conversation in a way that is not confrontational, that assumes positive intent. You can look for common ground and then, you know, come at it as a potential partner with whoever you're talking with. How can I help? How can we work together? Um, and then, as I said, keep an open mind about other people, about what the problem is, and also about what the solution or solutions might look like. Um, and so to wrap things up, uh, you know, we are leaders when we show up and offer to help and figure out how to make ourselves useful or invite others to join us. When we ask questions about how things work and then look and then others start looking to us for answers or a better understanding. When we see a problem or get an idea and then connect with others to figure out a solution. And when we advocate not only for what our own child needs, but for other children and families with similar needs. And uh, underlying all this is practicing empathy and respect for others, including those with whom we may disagree. Um, and I am going to, that's pretty much my presentation. So I am going to have uh, Suzanne drop the sign-in sheet uh, one more time and also the um, survey questionnaire that we have. We, we have a short participant survey, which we really appreciate if you could take because it helps us do better with our future programs. And then, um, and that's really about it. So we are going to send a follow-up uh, email with uh, all the, uh, the slides and all the, the links and resources that we mentioned. Um, and, uh, and of course, you can always feel free at any time to uh, reach out to Penn Families. Um, I'm Susan at PennFamilies.org or info at PennFamilies.org. Um, and we're always happy to try to answer questions and connect you with, with folks. And that is my presentation. Thank you so much. <laughs> Very helpful. <laughs> Good. And I didn't get uh, I didn't get what your uh, what school are is your child attending oh, again? Yeah, um, Hamilton. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. No, you're the same person, but you had your your child's name. Yeah, I changed my name. Okay, yes. now I'm now I'm making sense of it. <laughs> okay. Thank gotcha. You. All right. All right. Hi. All right. Thank you very much. And Marianne, any questions? Uh, I think I think I'm okay. Thank okay. you. It was a lot of information, but uh, um, hopefully you can digest it over time. So, all right. Well, thank you so much. Cool. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ada. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you, Jeff. See you later. <laughs>